catch them in the pasture, run them in the pen, work them on the Sundays, do it all again, race them in the sand, buck them in the mud, drip a cowboy's sweat, bleed a cowboy's blood. I'm Zeke Thurston, 2016 World Champion Saddlebrock Rider, and you're watching the Pepper Stewart Show. Oh, it's my turn. Just reading the paper. What's going on right here in uh, Tombstone, Arizona? This is the newspaper from October of 1881. Something happened. Something happened here down the street. I don't know. We'll get to that later. Sitting right here in the historic Birdcage Theater, as you look around and see what it looked like back in 1880s. Nice place. Got a lot of stuff going on today. We're going to discuss Tombstone, Arizona, what's going on all over here, what you can see, what you can't see, what you can do. We've got some news. Good news, bad news. We've got news. Mesquite Rodeo is still going on. We're going to talk about that for a minute. Um, we're going to talk about the trip through Arizona. Got a couple of, a couple of good interviews for you. Uh, we talked to the folks over at eQuest. We've got some great information that we're going to let you know about. And uh, Chancey Williams, his new single came out. Of course, it came out during quarantine or the lockdown, whatever you want to call it, depending on where you are. But stuff happened. We're going to talk about it. We're going to get to it. But if you're missing out on Sunday nights and not watching the number one drama on television, on cable television, you are missing out on Yellowstone. So if you want to know what happened, you want to recap, here you go. Turn that off. Can only turn it off when he meets his attorney. I am his attorney. Jamie is really clever. He's an incredibly clever survivalist, which makes him a good lawyer. City people find out really quick that country people have been to college, understand the same books, and can be formidable in the legal world just as well. But in this situation, he's created the mess and needs to get himself out. Do you recall the events I am repeating to you? And he's fighting with you the same rush that caused what happened in season two with killing the reporter. I think he has the same rush of anger, anxiety, and poor decision making. There's a full panic, I think, going. You out of your fucking mind? But this time, it's a little different. This time, Jamie realizes he's only thinking about himself to dig himself out of this hole. And it goes into more, I think, a self-preservation mode. In this world, in the world of Yellowstone, and in the world of John Dutton, everything is bigger. He's a big character, and Yellowstone is a huge place. The idea of it, for a man like the character of John Dutton, it's just so important to keep what you've built and what your father has built and just pass it down and keep it alive. You know, Governor Perry's got a lot of angles to play. The major antagonist this season, the financial group that comes in and wants to buy up everything. Everything around and want to turn it all into a ski resort. They come in with this proposal with the idea that this would be better for the state. That's progress, Governor, and progress has a price. As the governor of Montana, she has no choice but to think about the people of Montana and what that means, and that means the change, probably a lot of people to please, and a really big bear to, <laughs> to, to keep happy in John Dutton. Linnell and John are continuing their sort of romance and their sort of business relationship in a way that still serves her because she still wants to be the boss, but she really cares about John and she wants to meet his needs too as far as that legacy and keeping his family on top and involved. John Dutton admitting that he can't do everything. I admitted no such thing. <laughs> I love working with Wendy. We've had a great time since the, our very first scene together. In season two, you really got to see my character get fleshed out and really understand more of her backstory and who she was and what her relationship was with John. And then in season three, we took that to the next level. It was really exciting to see more of that. And also that I got to cross paths with other characters and into uh, other parts of the Yellowstone world where typically the governor doesn't go. Often I feel like Governor Perry steps in to take care of Jamie, help advance him because she sees promise in him. More than that, as a politician, she can use him. <laughs> and we do all this with what goal in mind? To negotiate an acceptable surrender. Money speaks louder than anything in this country. 
they're wanting to build an airport, basically a city where the ranch is. And any sensible human being would take the money, but of course that's not who we are or who he is, and we're gonna hold on to it. But that means fighting, it's not a person. It's this sort of invisible tsunami of power. I drive this road every single day. You're never here, and now you're here every day, while attorneys decide what properties to condemn. People see him as a villain from one perspective, but from my perspective, he is inevitable to progress. You will run into a Rourke eventually. He's bigger. This is what he does. People make toast for breakfast. He crushes companies and makes cities. So it's absolutely normal for him to do this. And he knows that he's bringing so many jobs and so much financial influence to an area that if the people don't want to sell, they'll just condemn it anyway. So it's kind of like that. The truth that is inevitable. Oh shit, Jimmy. It's really amazing for Jimmy, I think, to have found this sense of identity in rodeo and to have found this sort of sense of pride. Since he was a kid, he's been told and shown over and over again that he's a piece of shit. So like to be able to fuel that pride in himself and then to have that affirmed by his like newfound family, by this new community, for John Dutton to show up to watch Jimmy rodeo is like the closest thing to Jimmy's dad showing up to a t-ball game that he's ever felt in his life. Like I think it's profoundly meaningful for him. And all of that just goes right out the window the second he meets Mia. <laughs> as soon as he sees Mia, I think he forgets that John Dutton's even there. <laughs> John Dutton and Rip had been the center of Jimmy's world. And then as soon as he sees Mia, I think they just go right out of his head. Mia is a barrel racer that met Jimmy at a rodeo. And she's somebody that's like very sure of herself, very decisive, very grounded in, in what she wants and who she is. I'm trying really hard to think of something to say and just nothing's coming out. You could ask me on a date. She only knows him in the context of the thing that brings him the most pride in himself and the thing that makes him feel most like a person with something to offer. Jimmy. Is that your dad? Kind of, yeah. To see himself through her eyes, I think is like an incredible thing for Jimmy. Good luck. I think the initial interest sort of came from him as a bronc rider and like his talent. But I do think that w when they have the moment of like first meeting eyes and seeing each other, I do think that there's this sort of like miraculous thing that happens. Jimmy's a little taken aback by her directness, but. He has tremendous respect for these various rodeo sports. And then to see that she's an athlete, that she has like lives and breathes this lifestyle, I think that he looks up to her in a lot of ways. Like he's just getting started in the rodeo world and he sees her and he imagines this whole other life, this life in the rodeo, people that value him for what he values in himself. It's that moment that you like can't deny and you need to just follow your heart. And I think that happens for the both of them, but especially her. Having the first little moment with Jeff and then j them just putting me on a horse and giving me a flag and saying, okay, run around the arena in front of these like pretty legit like extras that have seen plenty of rodeos and are watching me do this and are probably like, oh my God. But it was really lucky because it couldn't have gone better and smoother. And it's really nice when there's sort of already a family dynamic in place with cast. And it's even better when, when they're so welcoming because you just get to sort of fall into their arms. All those bronc riding events, those kinds of accidents happen all the time. It does. <laughs> that happens. Um, the, that was, I guess that was episode three of season three. Didn't want to, didn't want to get y'all too far ahead because I don't know what you're picking up on. But in a lot of the groups, there was a lot of questions about what happened. And they're wanting to figure out why he wrecked, what happened to him, what was going on. Well, it happens a lot. I won't say a whole bunch, but it does happen a lot. From time to time, somebody will be in the shoot getting ready to go. 
and they nod their head to go. Well, for instance, he's looking at her and nods his head at her. The gate, the gate guy pulling the latches, all he's looking for is your head to nod. So he sees the head nod, the gate's open. And that's kind of what happened there and why he wrecked himself out. But uh, if you've watched us enough and you jump back on our social media, you'll find the interviews where we talked to uh, Jefferson that plays Jimmy. He actually won with his partner, Jay Novacek, and the team cutting here in Fort Worth last year. He actually won, competed on a cutting horse one. Taylor Sheridan was there. He competed. Uh, Cole Hauser was there. Rip, he was at the event. He didn't compete. We talked to him. You can find all that stuff on there uh, along with uh, Forey Smith. We visited with him too, but uh, it, it's a good show. It's, it's picking up. Nobody really knows where it's going to go, and everybody just sitting around waiting for the next one. There's, as soon as it's over on Sunday, they're like, when's the next one? We're ready to see what happens. And I don't, I don't want to give you too much ahead, so I, I'll leave it at that. But anyway, check it out. Yellowstone, if you haven't watched it, you need to go watch it. So let's go back here where I'm at in the historic birdcage. This is the actual building of the birdcage. It's been here since the 1800s. A lot of things happen here. This is the, the middle you see there. And then back up here on the top, you've got the actual bird cages where they sit. Now, we couldn't go up there because it's, you know, it's a couple hundred years old and the floors aren't that great, so they didn't want anybody going up there and wandering around and falling through the floor. But it was neat to see um, how it's portrayed on Tombstone. If you watch the Tombstone, the one with Val Kilmer, the 93 Tombstone, which is the best. And so when... Uh, you watch that, and then you see the building. It's, it brings a lot of it back to you. So the birdcage, let's look at some. I got some other shots here from the birdcage. And let's see what what you're looking at. That's the outside looking in. That's the old, still the old building. It's been, you know, cleaned up a little bit, but it still looks good. Uh, when you go inside, you can see that's kind of where we're sitting at. And you're looking up at the other side of the uh of the cages and then you have little areas on the bottom where they have some card tables set up and, and things and uh what else do we have more more of the top and then do we have the table in the back okay there's the stage that stage is tiny the stage right here is tiny tiny and right there in front of the stage you can see you can't i think you can see it from the picture but being in there you can see the bullet holes where they were shooting, if the actors weren't any good on the stage, they would shoot at the stage. There's bullet holes all through the stage. And then back behind the stage, you had people that would be working back behind there, you know, dodging bullets too. Is that like a, a cellar door or something, like right underneath yes. the stage? Yes. That is, the stage has a drop. It has a drop down. So you have an understage. That's under it. And that goes that goes down to the bottom. Creepy. And when you go... Okay, that's the that's the working quarters right there. That's where the girls are earning their earning their living. N not a very big room. Now that right there, what you're looking at is some other tables. That's under the stage. The little the rail where that rail's going. There's those little steps. That's what comes out onto the stage right there. So that's under the stage. And I've got some shots. I've got a lot of pictures of this place, but I'm. I'm not going to put too much out there because you need to go see it. But if right there where that stage is, you walk around the, the rail there, and under that rail is like their trash storage bin that hasn't been, they say it hasn't been touched in 100 years or so, which it doesn't look like it has. And you can look in there, and they're just old pieces of metal. There's old, uh, like, whiskey barrels and stuff just all stashed up in there. So it's this place. You want to come check it out. You know, we're here all, we're here all day. We're here at night doing the uh, paranormal. They do offer a paranormal uh, tour of the building itself. And it's it's worth checking out because he, here in Tombstone, the history, the legacy, it's just something just to go walk outside and walk down the street, you know, of Tombstone, Arizona with all the, the legend that happened there. And while you're there, you can get one of these. This right here is the Tombstone Epitaph. And what this is, is the newspaper. It's a copy, of course, of the newspaper that went out with the gunfight at the OK Corral. And in this paper, you have eyewitness testimony from everyone that was there, even Sheriff Behan's testimony here. And uh, it's, it's interesting reading. It's something you do, you do want to check out. 
Now, if you go up the hill here in Tombstone, you make your way over to Boot Hill. And when you get to Boot Hill, that is where a lot of the outlaws are buried. So the, those four grave sites right there you're looking at, that is Tom McLarry, Frank McLarry, and Billy Clanton that was killed at the gunfight right there. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the... Uh, a little about that uh, cemetery because there's some stuff I didn't know. Of course, Boot Hill was used to be the name of a lot of cemeteries. A lot of cemeteries were called Boot Hill back in the early, you know, 19th, 20th century because it was common, and they called it Boot Hill because that's where gunfighters died with their boots on. You died with your boots on, they called it Boot Hill, and that's where you're buried. Um, now, this graveyard was founded back in 1878, and they stopped accepting people back in 1883. With a few exceptions, but other than that, they moved on down the road to a bigger, a bigger cemetery. Now, some of the notable folks in this gravesite, you had uh, Marshal Fred White, who was killed by Curly Bill Brocious, you know, Wild Bill. Uh, of course, the OK Corral shootout guys. You got Big Dan. Uh, you got Tex Howard, uh, Billy Delaney. Those guys were the perpetrators and the Bisbee massacre, and they were legally hanged. In, uh, 1884. Now John Heath is buried there too, and he was accused of organizing the robbery that led to the massacre. His his grave marker is near there, but his body was removed and brought to his hometown of Terrell, Texas, just east of Dallas. So he's buried in Terrell. Uh, you got Jack Dunlop, Three Finger Jack. I wonder why he's called that. China Mary, she ran the. Uh, general store. She sold Chinese goods and American goods there, but here's something else that you need to know if you're going to visit Boot Hill. There's some notable grave markers, but they're fictitious. There's some grave sites that's not real. And there's the notable ones that you do see, you see on a lot of uh, memorabilia that, that's sold out there, and that's Lester Moore. And his grave site says, here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. And the story was that he was gunned down as a Wells Fargo, you know, carrier and nacho and died in a shootout, but he's not buried there. That's, that's not there. Uh, George Johnson, there's a George Johnson there, and his says, here lies George Johnson, hanged by mistake in 1882. He was right, we was wrong, but strung him up, now he's gone. Well, that's not real either. That's just a, that's just another one I got up there, but uh, it's it's worth checking out. You know, if you're, you're going to hit Tombstone, you got to hit them all. Um, when you leave out of Tombstone, you will run across a grave, and it's not close. And you got to wonder how far they rode to get there. And that's the grave site of Johnny Ringo. Now, his his headstone there is out in i think it's called dragoon dragoon arizona it's it's a it's a pretty good haul from over there we drove drove a while to get out of to it um the story with johnny ringo is kind of it's kind of different you know you've seen the movie tombstone and you've seen that uh it appeared that doc holiday shot him well here's the deal a local uh local farm guy from turkey creek arizona came across the body of a dead man sitting against a tree the bullet wound pierced the man's temple, and the revolver with one bullet missing was found in his hand. And the deceased guy was identified as Johnny Ringo. Now, his death was ruled a suicide, and they buried his body right there where it was found. The deal was he'd been, he'd been laying there for a few days. And you know what happens in the 110 degrees, which it is 110 degrees, and it's hot a few days. It don't take long to stink and bloat, so they wanted to get him in the ground. So they buried him right there. Now, when they learned of his death, the Tombstone Epitaph, this newspaper, they published that many friends would mourn him and many others would take secret delight in learning of his death because he, he was quite a uh, character. You know, but a lot of people questioned the circumstances of his death. Uh, now, if you want to know about Ringo, he was born in 1850 in Indiana and then just kind of moved across till he hit California, lived in California for a while, his father accidentally killed himself, and then Ringo moved to uh, Mason County, Texas, in 1870, and you know, eventually moved his his way on back up towards Arizona. Now he had limited education, but he liked quoting Shakespeare. 
And then they put that they threw that in the movie, the Tombstone movie, with them, him and uh, Doc Holliday speaking Latin back and forth to each other. Uh, Ringo showed up in Arizona in 1879, then made his way to Tombstone, took up with the Cowboys, a local rustling gang. Now, as everybody knows, him and, and uh, Wild Herb Doc Holliday didn't get along. Well, a couple interviews later in life before Wild Herb died, he took credit for killing Johnny Ringo. But as research showed, Earp had already left Arizona and was in Colorado at the time that Johnny Ringo was dead. It had also been alleged that Doc Holliday killed him. And that's what they portrayed in the in the movie, you know, Tombstone, the 93 Tombstone movie. But the deal is, nobody really knows. So the majority of evidence seems to support their original findings that he died of suicide. Nobody knows. If he didn't take his own life, what for? Nobody Nobody has any idea. But if you're on the way out there, you're going to see 10,000 billboards. I'm not exaggerating. There are 10,000 billboards that say the thing on there. And that's all it says. The thing. The thing. That's all you see. But when you get there, it's a huge gas station with a gift shop. And inside the gift shop, back in the back, is the thing. So you pay your few bucks and see, what, what does it say here? It says, what if human history as you know it's a lie? So you take a journey in there, and you look around, and it's just a lot of what-if stuff going on. And it's, it's worth it. I think it was only like five bucks to go through, but... You, you want to go through there. You want to go through the thing, and you want to check it out. Because that's, I was I was like, why are there so many billboards for this thing? What is this? And then I had to stop and get some gas. And so I was like, well, I'll just go in there and see what's going on. When it, it's, but it, it's worth it's worth the trip. You want to stop. You want to stop in there and take a look at it. It's worth it. You can Google it as well and check it out. But it's, it's good. I don't know if it's as good as Mesquite Rodeo, but uh, it's pretty good. Mesquite Rodeo is going. It's still open. Uh, at first, you didn't have to wear a mask. Now you wear a mask when you get in. You go in. You sit down. You watch the rodeo. It's air conditioned. Go in there and have a good time. Take your family out. Do something. And take a look at the highlights from last week. Night number six of the Mesquite Championship Rodeo Series in Mesquite, Texas on Saturday night, July the 11th. Ag night in Mesquite. They saluted Longhorn cattle and agriculture. It was fun to be in the great state of Texas. Fun to be at a rodeo. Fun to watch the bareback riding that kicked off the night. Justin Time Lewis, Jasper, Texas. He ends up winning the night with a 75. Chance Merrill from Kansas was second. But Jasper, Texas's Justin Lewis had kind of a weird night. You see his horse tried to come out backwards on him. He was actually offered a re-ride, but still made a good enough spur ride to win the rodeo. That was a horse from the New Star Pro Rodeo Company, kind of a younger bucking horse. Once he got it figured out, getting started in the arena, a really good night for that horse. Justin Lewis, 75 points, wins the night. Chance Merrill second, Josh Green third, Montana Duval in the number four spot in the bareback riding. Let's talk about steer wrestling. The native of Arkansas, Chance Howard from Sadler, Texas, has a quick time and a fast throw and a time of four seconds flat to win the night in Mesquite. That was worth over $1,000. Maverick Harper in the number two spot. He's from Iowa, Louisiana. Gary Gilbert, Springtown, Texas, third. World champion Hunter Cure split fourth with Brighton Edmondson. Chance Howard, a time of four seconds flat to win the steer wrestling on Saturday night in Mesquite. The winners of the team roping came from Slack, Jake Orman and Bryce Wrights with a time of 4.8, but right behind them, world champions. Cody Snow and the all-around champion Junior Negata, 4.9. Clay Smith and Jade Corkill 4-9. Snow and Negata have really been dominant in Mesquite. They really kind of established their partnership in Mesquite. They started winning their first win together as partners this year. Came at the Mesquite Rodeo back on June the 6th, and they've placed multiple times since then. Cody Snow and Junior Negata, a time of 4.9, the fast time of the performance on Saturday night. Breakaway roping, lightning fast. Martha Angelone, 
who is third in the WPRA's world standing, Stephenville, Texas, a time of two seconds flat. Right behind her, Mackenzie Ray and Brandy Gilbert both have had great performances in the skeet at 2.1. Jamie Markram at 2.2. Colt Gordon won the saddle bronc riding a horse called Hammer Cocked from Stay Smith. This was a re-ride. He had already been 84 and a half on that horse. At a previous rodeo, he was 84 and a half in Mesquite on Saturday night. Two points better than the national finalist Bradley Harder, 82 and a half in the number two spot. Colt Gordon, what a pretty spur ride. Really beating the horse to the ground. Keegan Smith finishes third in a tie with Parker Kempfer. That's the saddle bronc riding in Mesquite. The tie-down roping winner came out of slack, Quade Hyatt from Canyon, Texas. His second win in Mesquite of the seven and six. But watch J.D. McQuistian from Collinsville, Texas. Smooth flank, quick tie, 8.3 ties in with Macon Murphy for the number two spot. Robert Mathis from Mark, Texas, fourth with a time of 8.9. In the barrel race, Macy Ray back-to-back -back wins at the Mesquite Championship Rodeo. She was a winner on the 4th of July. She was a winner on the 11th of July. The only time fast than 15 seconds of 1497 on her horse Espresso. National finalist Tiani Schuster and Cassie Mowry finished second and third. Tammy Seamus from Brock, Texas in the number four spot. It's easy to talk about who won the bull riding on Saturday night. It was the Bulls. Of the 14 guys that got on, 14 guys got bucked off. The New Star Rodeo Company had a great pen of bucking bulls. That's what happened. Night number six in Mesquite, July the 11th, July the 18th. Night number seven, Military Appreciation Night. Go to mesquiterodeo.com and get all the details. Go. Go do it. Get out there and watch some rodeo. Actually, no Mesquite. Uh, you know, they announced back in the 1st of June, hey, we're going to have rodeo as usual. We're coming on. We're going to... We're going to have a show. We're going to do what we need to do. Follow the guidelines and have it. Social distance and all that. So they've been doing it since June. And the PBR has been having events without fans. They had a bunch up at Lazy E Arena. And a bunch of events have been going on without fans in the stands. So after a while, this past weekend, the PBR is now able to allow fans in the stands. So fans were welcome back to some rodeo action with the professional bull riders and they're doing their their team competition so you got your different teams you know team cooper tires team pendleton you got the different teams and you got team riders well this happened to be team cooper tires getting it done and you're like well who are the masked men that right there is jose victor lemmy sage kimsey stetson lawrence Keyshawn whitehorse and Beside them is, uh, <laughs> I was like, did I miss one? I was, oh, that's, <laughs> that's, a, what the heck? Who was that again? Oh, oh Sean Gleason. Okay. I was like, who's the, who's the other masked man? It's Sean Gleason, hey, PDR CEO. in your defense, they have masks on. Well, they're, they're masked men. I'm like, what's going on? Are they going to hold me up or are they going to ride a bull? I don't know. But those are your guys that want it. So in front of a crowd. So crowds are coming back. We're going to see what it does. I don't know. It's, it's Corona time everywhere you go. There's. You got mixed messages on it everywhere. Nobody knows. Everybody's guessing. The numbers go up. The numbers go down. I just, I would like for the news to report the people that are sick, not the people that are positive. Because some people are positive with corona, but they're not sick. Just tell me the numbers of people that are sick. That would help a lot. And that would calm the hysteria. But you don't want to calm the hysteria. That's not that's not the agenda right now so let's just uh drink a corona and go watch some bull riding or you can do something else you want to help somebody you want to do something for somebody uh equest has their big gala every year they have a big fundraiser donation event for equest which they do uh, a lot of horseback events horseback schools they have a uh, programs for veterans, for children, for uh, people with disabilities. They've got a, it's a great program. Well, their gala is coroned out because it's corona time. So they're not having it. So it's going to be an online deal. It's actually going on right now. So to tell you a little bit more about that, I had uh, the legendary Navy veteran Sherry Smith drop in with me to visit with Joan from EQuest. And here's what happened. All right, we are talking today with EQuest, and on the line, we've got Joan Cutler from EQuest, along with myself. If you don't know now, you know you got Pepper Stewart here, along with the legendary Navy veteran Sherry Smith, my co-host, <laughs> on the line with us. 
And we're going to talk to Joan about eQuest and kind of find out what they've got going on here in Dallas, kind of what it's about, different things and opportunities they have. And, uh, you know, Corona's been going on. Everybody has it or they don't or they drank it. We don't know. So we're talking about just a little bit of everything. So with that, Joan, what have you been up to? Well, I was just telling you before we um, came on the air that I have been cleaning stalls because usually we have a bunch of volunteers to come out and help the barn folks with that. And I've been gladly cleaning stalls because it's kept me out of the house and with the horses. And even though we haven't been able to see clients, we've been able to be out with the horses and keep them going and keep them in good shape for when we get for when we got started. Okay, and eQuest, we've you know we've talked about eQuest from time to time over the last year or so, but do you want to kind of tell the folks a little bit about eQuest and, and what you guys do? So eQuest is a traditional therapeutic horsemanship program. Um, we offer several different programs. Horsemanship is probably our biggest program, um, and that teaches kids and adults to ride to the best of their ability. So in our therapeutic riding program, that means that some people may ride with a leader and two sidewalkers. Some become very independent riders. Um, we also offer physical therapy and occupational therapy incorporating the horse. So instead of going to a clinic and sitting on a big rubber ball, you come to eQuest and the therapists incorporate the movement of the horse into their therapy treatment plan. Um, we also offer equine facilitated counseling. So we have three mental health professionals that work at eQuest, um, and they use the horse as part of their counseling program. And again, instead of going and sitting on a couch and talking to somebody, you come out and the horse and the equine specialist and the mental health professional go out in the pasture or wherever they decide to do their activities that day and, and do their counseling in that way. Um, we also do therapeutic carriage driving, which is just what it sounds. We hook a horse up to a carriage and learn to drive. And you guys do a lot of stuff right, right now is, it's June, it's PTSD month. You know, um, June 27th is actually PTSD day. So, you know, you guys offer the, the hooves and heroes that helps folks with that. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So our Hopes for Heroes program is actually our veterans program, our military veteran program. Um, and all the programs that I just talked about earlier, we offer to military veterans, um, active duty, and their family members. Um, in our traditional programming, we require the clients to have a diagnosis to come and participate. But because our veterans program is a wellness program, we want them to come out and, and hang out with us, so we do not require a diagnosis for that. Um, PTS is um, post-traumatic syndrome, and it can happen in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of people think that only combat trauma um, leads to post-traumatic syndrome, um, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, but trauma can be caused by anything um, that overwhelms a person's ability to, to cope. And what's traumatic for one person might not be traumatic for the other. So we incorporate the horse into the treatment plan. Um, horses don't lie, um, and they live in on high alert, but they are also peaceful, which models for clients struggling with PTS how they can do the same, how you can be on high alert and yet calm yourself and live a peaceful life. Horses are also herd animals, um, which models for clients how to live in and be supported by a community. Um, we heal through relationships with others and that includes, includes the horse. Um, horses are also sensitive to their environment which includes humans. So they mirror back to the client what the client is experiencing, providing immediate and honest feedback. So you can BS a lot of things, but you can't really do that to a horse. 
No, and, and there's there's been so much research and studies done on, on equine therapy and its wonderful success rate on, on people who for people who serve and also civilians that have been through traumatic experiences, which is more and more often nowadays. Uh yes. so I, I'm curious how how long does it take where you typically see a response to this type of therapy? I mean, of course, I know it's going to be different per person, per trauma. Um, but do you, do you see well, kind of what are the results? And do they come back more than once? Do, is it a, a week-long thing, a one-day thing, or is it something that extends over months? So you're completely correct in the fact that it's different for everybody. Um, equine facilitated counseling sessions usually are scheduled just like you would regular therapy um, once a week. So a client would come on Monday at five o'clock um, and continue to come as long as they are um, working with the with the mental health professional and meeting their goals and continuing to see progress. So um, one of the statistics that we can share is that in 2019, 100% of the EQUEST equine facilitated clients reported a decrease in their PTS symptoms as much as a third. So their symptoms went down a third. Um, and we saw, I'm going to have to get this number right, I think about 50 clients in 2019. So it, it definitely worked. And, um, but it's very dependent on the client and what their Absolutely. needs are. Right, their participation, and and then I I know that level of of post traumatic stress disorder can certainly vary among people. Um, huge vary, <laughs> huge difference yes. among different people. So. And so I did see on your website that you have trained professionals trained. Uh, therapists that come in. Can you tell me about who they are and what they do? So Leslie West is our men our mental health um, manager, and mm -hmm. she is a licensed counselor. Um, and then we have two other contract therapists that come out and work with us. And one is there on Mondays, and I think Karen is there on Tuesdays and Fridays. And so we have counseling services available um, Monday through Saturday at EQUEST. Um, okay. And Leslie, Leslie, who's our counseling manager, schedules all of those um, sessions. Okay. Well, if there if there's a veteran, you know, that's, that's listening or watching us, and they're interested in the program, they're local to, to Dallas, and they want to join the program, how would they do that? They can go to the website, which is www.equest.org, and there is a ton of information on our website. Um, there's a tab for programs, and then there's a tab for the veterans program, or they are more than welcome to contact me directly. My name's Joan Cutler. Um, my email address is J as in Joan, Cutler, C-U-T-L-E-R, at equest.org. And our phone number is on our website, but it's 972-412-1099. And my personal extension is 213. And I am glad to schedule a tour with anyone that wants to come out and see what we do and learn about our program. Um, people enter the EQUEST Just for Heroes program in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Um, Military veterans are service oriented, so a lot of them come to us as volunteers um, because they want to come and help, and they they get to the program as volunteers. And once they're there, they realize that we have services that they can benefit from. So I don't really care how you get to request. As long as you get to eQuest and let us talk to you and tell you a little bit about what we do. Oh, I was just going to say that you know it, it's wonderful that you reach so many also because there's so many that need this kind of therapy and to not have to use either as much medication as they would otherwise, 
And I know sometimes that, that there are some that really don't want to use any medication at all that might be prescribed from the VA. And so to have something else for them to try and see mm-hmm. if it's successful for them, and it sounds like it is, um, that's huge. That's, that's a, a wonderful gift to give those who would die for our freedom. So thank you for all your hard work. Well, thank you for your service. Um, I also want to make sure that I mention that services for active duty military and their immediate family is free of charge at eQuest. Um, Mm -hmm. We feel that you have paid the price, so we offer those services for free. Donating to the cause or, or helping you guys out. What's the best way to to reach out to you guys? Again, our website has a lot of information. Um, Boots and Salutes is usually our largest fundraising raiser for our military Hoods for Heroes Veterans program, um, but we are doing it virtually this year um, because everything's a little different. Um, so the week starting July the 12th will be um, our virtual giving week. There'll be an auction, and we're also rolling out a new thing called the Wall of Heroes. And there'll be different um, levels that you can participate in. And it will be on our webpage. And for um, differing amounts of donation, you'll be able to honor um, either a current military person in your life or a veteran that you want to um, honor by having them on our wall. So there okay. is a twelve hundred. There's a twelve hundred dollar level, and then a five hundred dollar level, and I think a two fifty, a one hundred, and then we have a roll call level that's fifty dollars. So that is one way that you can donate to the Hoops for Heroes program. Okay. Okay, well that that works. We'll get that out out there uh, to the folks in viewer land and listening land. And you know, Joan Joan Cutler right here with Equest. You know, we appreciate you visiting with myself, uh, Pepper Stewart, and Sherry Smith. Uh, tell us a little bit about what Equest is doing this month, especially for June, which is the PTSD month, and a little bit about you guys and what you got going on. Which everything's different now because. Just everything is, you know, it's COVID-19. Put your mask on, close the doors, lock it up. So everything's changed, everything's different. But life still goes on. We've got things to deal with. So we really appreciate you visiting with us and uh, tell us what you guys are doing. And uh, we'll see you. I didn't think he would ever stop talking. That guy just rambles forever. Golly. Cattle market. What's going on with cow stuff? Cow stuff is everywhere. You can step in it. Uh, you can rub it on your face for a uh, help your wrinkles. Probably not, but do it anyway. Um, the market reports go to pepperstuart.com. Click on livestock market reports, and you can see reports from Texas and beyond. I had to say beyond because I had a few folks say, "Well, you don't have mine or this one or this one close to me." Well. It's close enough. If yours is not there, then have your local cell barn send it to me, and it will be there. But we got a lot. Most it's mostly North Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas, a couple all the way in California that do have cows there, and uh, Missouri, I believe. So there's it's spread out. You can get a good idea what the market price is going for. And then also, there is a group on the Book of Faces called North Texas Beef to Table, I think, something like that group. And you can get in there and you can buy meat directly from processing shops and directly from the farms. If you want to cut out the middleman, you want to get fresh beef, get on there, check it out, and you can do that. All right, let's talk about cow stuff. There is an article that came out with Corona Time about cattle traceability. And we've been talking about that on here for years, about the traceability. And people thinking, you know, with all the stuff going on, should it be traceable? Because if you don't know, there is a coronavirus vaccine for cattle that's been around for years and years, if you didn't know about that. So anyway, they put out a poll to see what producers think about traceability. So the poll went out last year. When it got big again, it's going out again this year. So 
the readers didn't change their opinion that much. You got about 64% of the people are for traceability. You got 36% that are not. And when they did the survey last year in 2019, you had 62% wanting it and 38 said no. Um, so there's a lot, so they asked people, well, what is it about the traceability that you want? Why do you want a, nas- a national ID system? And they just said disease, disease containment and track back was 80% of the reason why they wanted it. But you still have those that don't. So they ask why. For those that don't support a national lifelong individual animal ID, the biggest reason for the question was who's going to pay for it? What's it going to cost? Who's going to pay for it? 65% want to know about that. Uh, Followed by the lack of data confidentiality, about 47%. uh, 37% think that brands and bangs tags are good enough. Uh, 36% said it's potential liability from future buyers. And 33%, you had the old man on the front yard saying nobody's business, what I do with my cows. You had 25% had technology concerns, and 23% said it slows down commerce, and 19% didn't even know what it was about, so they have no comment. So that's what's going on with traceability, beef traceability, what's going on with the cow market. Um, A study went out today I was reading about importing beef, and I should have brought that story to you, but I'm not. I'll bring it up next time, but I was just wanting to know why we import so much beef, why we're not eating all the beef here well the deal is a majority of your hamburger meat is not from here it's coming from australia or new zealand because we have such higher quality cattle here in the u.s it's more of your your better cut so it's not as fatty as what you need for hamburger meat that's why there's not as much hamburger meat and that's why it comes from somewhere else in case you're wondering uh, if you use your friend the google you can look that up and check it out while i was hanging out on uh on corona time i visited with Chancy Williams he had his new record coming out and big had a big uh, Zoom release party, Facebook Live release party for his new album because musicians aren't playing anywhere because nothing's open. Unless, well, yeah, we'll leave that out. Anyway, check out this latest video from Chancy Williams and see what he had to tell me because I don't know. the hard times when they sell you on this game they just talk about the girls and all that whiskey and the fame but even if i'd known i'd have saddled up anyway something about this quest for gold lights of fire in your blood and your soul won't rest till there's another Notch carved in your gun You'd best keep a sharp eye When you make a name Cause there's always some new younger Jesse James Just nod your head and say a prayer Every time they crack the latch Cause that number on your shirt Is like a bullseye on your back Sometimes all you hits the ground No, it ain't easy trying to be the fastest gun in town As you shuffle down the street side of this place called Rodeo Pass the lights and all the laughter You'll come across the bones of all those broken dreams scattered in the ditch. Cause some of us just don't know how to quit. We just nod our head and say a prayer every time they crack the latch. Cause that number on your shirt is like a bullseye on your back. Some days you don't clear your leather Sometimes all you hits the ground No, it ain't easy trying to be the fastest gun The fastest gun in town Every mile and every scar Every 
drop of blood and sweat is worth it. When I nod my head and say a prayer, and that gate man cracks the latch, and who I am is more than just a number on my back. And I'll ride hell for leather, maybe someday I'll go down in history, just trying to be the fastest gun in town. you enjoyed that tune that's a great song check it out look up more of those videos always some good cowboy songs right there and with that we've got the man that made that happen chancy williams what is going on what are you up to no oh how you guys doing oh just up here in wyoming uh enjoying summer about to start so the weather's Way getting up nice. is it wyoming is it cold when does the cold start well, the cold usually starts like in the fall. It could be September, October, and then it usually gets warm again right around now, like middle of May, first of June. Depends you on know, the year. I always but look, like, right, yeah, I always look up. I would look up there. I'm like, man, it looks it looks nice. It looks like great country. And then I see videos of three foot snow feeding cows out of helicopters. I'm like, you know what? I don't think I want to go that far. Yeah, it ain't as bad as a helicopter, but you know, this, once, once you're used to living in the snow, we've grown up with it, it's, it's nice, it keeps all the tourists out, so it toughens you up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that will. You know, with your, let's let's throw the, the viewers out there with your background. A lot of folks know, a lot of folks don't know, so, you know, you, you rodeo and music, so how'd that come about? You know, what's your rodeo, what's your rodeo background like as far as the Saddle Bronx Rider? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I grew up on a ranch up here in the northeast corner of Wyoming in a small town called Moorcroft, and uh, my folks have ranched there since 1985, and we run sheep and cows, and all growing up, me and my brothers rodeoed, you know, we started real young youth rodeos, you know, we were five and six years old going to those youth rodeos, and then that went on into, obviously, high school, our team roped and uh, roped calves and rode saddle broncs all through high school, and then went to high school finals all my senior year in Springfield, Illinois, and then ended up getting a rodeo scholarship to Casper College. And so in college, I roped calves, team rope, and rode saddle bronx. But my main event was riding saddle bronx because I enjoyed that the most. So ended up going to college for rodeoing for four years at college rodeo, and all made the college finals twice. And yeah, it was it was a a fun time. You know, rodeo's such a fun lifestyle, and it's a the rodeo family is just a the rodeo world is just a giant family, so everybody knows everybody. So I've met a lot of my longtime friends that I've had through rodeo. Yeah, and you got some good rodeo tunes. I mean, uh, you know, I was listening to to a lot of your stuff and scrolling through some YouTube videos and things. I mean, you got you got some good stuff. You know, good good country cowboy music. You know, up and down the road. You know, because a lot a lot of folks who don't know that that rodeo. You know, you spend a lot of time on the road, so you're always looking for something to listen to because you it, people don't understand what it's like to travel. You hear the same twenty songs over and over for an hour. Yeah, that's the thing. Something you're like, you're like well, what can I listen to? I need some good music while I'm on the road and going. I mean, and you got some, you got that. You know, you got some of that stuff. And speaking of your rodeo and your music, you are one of two that went out there, Road Bronx and Cheyenne, like Chris Ledoux did back in the day. Road Bronx in Cheyenne and concert and performed a concert in Cheyenne too. So what was that like? Yep. It was neat. You know, growing up in Wyoming, it's every young cowboy's dream to ride at Cheyenne. You know, I mean, Cheyenne's the, the daddy of them all. And me and my brothers always wanted to ride bucking horses there because my dad won Cheyenne in 1971. 
And then, uh, so he's had that Cheyenne buckle our whole lives. And our dream was always to, to ride there and try to win it. And, you know, uh, so we were, you know, able to ride there and it was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, during that time I had a band started. So, you know, I never would have dreamed when I was riding there that several years later I'd be playing there just because I didn't know where music was going to take me. Cause back then, you know, all the, the main focus for both of me and my brother and my little brother was, was just rodeo. And I, I was just kind of doing music for a side thing for fun. But then a few years later, yeah, we got to play the main stage with, with Merle Haggard. And it was one of the coolest things ever. And it was, uh, it was definitely a night I'll, I'll remember for the rest of my life. And my dad, I, I never ended up winning Cheyenne. I ended up second there. So, uh, that night I asked dad, I was like, can I wear your Cheyenne buckle when I play at Cheyenne on the main stage? It's pretty neat. Yeah. And that, that's one of those memories that, that, uh, you know, they'll go with you forever. You know, you never forget, you know, that, that moment yeah. to be out there on, on the big stage and do that. You know, we're, we're down here in Texas. We listen to a lot of, a lot of good country music here in Texas. And I don't know, being in Wyoming, if you know about the law here in Texas, but there's a law here in Texas. If you play country music, you play good country, you've got to have a fiddle in the band. Only That's in Texas, right. you've got to have a fiddle in the band. And and you do. So can you tell us a little bit about, about your band, those that uh, that play with you? Yeah, you know, we, uh, as you guys know, you know, like the, the population in Wyoming ain't very big. It's, we, we've got about 600,000 people live here. So like trying to find great musicians that are willing to travel all the time has been difficult over the years. But we, I've been very fortunate, you know, with the group I got between me and, my band and my crew guys, there's 10 of us and we're a giant family, but yeah, we, 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 uh, we hired a fiddle player. She had been about 10 years ago. Uh, found a girl here in, in, in Casper, Wyoming that played and she came and audition has been with us every day since it's Brooke Lack. And she, uh, she, she plays the heck out of the fiddle and sings background vocals and, and looks real good. So she definitely is a, is a great piece to, to our band. Now, don't, don't forget your other guy. Now, everybody gets mad about the bass player. So you want to throw out who, who you got playing bass and who you got playing drums. That's right. Who you got back there. Don't, don't, don't forget the background. I want to throw those guys out there, too. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, shoot. Yeah, so, like, me and my drummer, Travis, we started this band in high school, you know, just kind of for fun and then played through college. So we've been together the whole time. And then, oh, several years later, we met Wyatt Springsteen, our lead guitar player. He's from Saratoga, Wyoming. And, uh. He fit right in. His his younger brother played with us at one point in time, and then uh, let's see our bass player. His name's Jay Lee Downey, and he he lives in Loveland, Colorado. He's the first uh, first member I ever hired that wasn't from Wyoming. And then uh, let's see back there on the we, we have an auxiliary player we just hired um, back in uh, not August or September, and he's actually the first guy from Texas we've ever hired. His name's Brett Hendricks. He's from Waco. So I, th- I think he I covered all the, the band. Yeah, yeah. What's he that? He wasn't from the. He wasn't a branch to Vidian. Vidian was he? No, I don't think so. <laughs> he he, uh, he he first played on the road out there for oh several Texas guys. He was oh with Casey Donahue for a while, and then ended up he he liked being in Wyoming. So we said, come on up. We'd love to have you. Now, as far as your your, your music and and what you play, what was your your musical influence. What what music did you listen to growing up that, that kind of pushed you in the direction that you're in? Well, you know, I always tell people that, you know, growing up in Wyoming, playing guitar and rodeo, and everybody looked up to Chris Ledoux forever. I mean, he, he's the king of Wyoming. And so obviously Chris Ledoux, but, you know, grew up listening to a whole bunch of George Strait because, I mean, there's not a lot of guys in uh, in country music that, that are actual cowboys. I mean, there's a lot of people that sing about the cowboy stories and the cowboy lifestyle, but there's, there's only been a handful over the years that have actually, you know, set foot in the arena and done it at, you know, at a professional level. So obviously George Strait, the hell of a hand team roper, Chris will obviously world champion. So I've looked up to George and Chris my whole life, but you know, there's some other ones, Dan Seals, just some of them guys that used to sing great country music. Now you had a you had a big release during during the NFR, you know, back at the NFR. What was that like? Yeah, we uh well we've been really fortunate, you know, we've got to do the opening ceremony at the NFR the last four years in a row and so, you know, growing up rodeoing, it's every cowboy's dream is to 
to, to nod your head um, out of them yellow bucking shoots in the Thomas and Mack Center. And, you know, you know, my rodeo career was kind of getting toward the end, and I was starting to play music more, so I had to make a choice whether to play music or rodeo. So chose music, but I knew right then I'd probably never be able to ride at the NFR because I quit playing or quit 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 rodeo. And so um, getting, to, getting to do the opening ceremony is, is huge for a guy like me that, you know, knows everybody back there that's getting on, you know, we're friends with most of the contestants. And it's just the, the energy in the Thomas and Mack Center on those nights when it's sold out 18,000 people. It's, it means more to me than probably a lot of other artists because a lot of other, you know, people in country music might not understand rodeo quite like I do. So it's, it's a big deal for us. We love the, the national finals rodeo. Now you got an album coming out. You got an album coming out. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep, got an album coming out uh, Friday, May 22nd, and uh, it's my fifth album, and uh, yeah, we're really excited about it. We've been working on it for a couple of years, you know. Uh, Trent Wilman did my last album, and this is the second one I got to do with Trent, so we've got to spend, uh, spend a lot more time together, and you know, he's obviously a Texas boy that was very successful in writing as an artist and producing a lot of guys, but we're, we're really excited about this. Trent and I wrote quite a few songs on there i wrote some with my friend jody stevens but there's a combination of a, you know like we always do put a lot of rodeo songs on there and stuff that our rodeo buddies would enjoy listening to going up and down the road and then there's also we, we put some different stuff on this we put some a couple love songs on there that we don't really haven't really done a lot of love songs in the past we mostly stick to you know wild party uh rodeo type music but we thought we'd do some songs for the for the girls on this one so yeah there's a there's a touch of touch of everything on this and then we uh brooke and i my uh my fiddle player we we did a cover song on this one we redid the old dan seals marie osmond song called meet me in montana which we're real excited about oh that's a that's a great that's a great song right there yeah and i listened to it all growing up you know and i think it was released in 1982 and nobody had ever really redone it and i was telling trent when we were down there and I was writing with him. I was like, you know, we should, we should do that. We should redo that song. And it was, uh, it turned out really well. I'm, I'm really happy the way it turned out. Now, are you, are you a big, uh, are you a big griller? Are you, are you a big fan of cooking out and uh, hanging out the grill and, and grilling some steaks? Yeah, we sure are. I, I think, I think Texas, Texans and Wyoming nights are about the same under that aspect. They, they love good, good food and good grilling. Uh, yeah, so let me throw this at you before we get out of here. Are are you okay. looking the same as we are as making a law to be punishable by jail time that if if we grill you a steak and you put ketchup on there, that's automatic 30 days in jail? Yeah, for sure. We've already kicked all those people out of the state of Wyoming <laughs> to do that. So, like, they're not allowed to be in here no more. Yeah. So a ketchup yeah. and a steak shouldn't even be within within – Six feet of each other. It should be social distancing for ketchup and steak for sure forever. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you ever if you ever come back, you're getting a hot dog. That's right. We just don't invite <laughs> them back. You know, you don't put you don't put ketchup on a steak. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. We, we got we got to get that passed. We we'll get that passed at some point. But you know, you know, I, we appreciate you taking time to visit with us and, and tell us a little bit about what you do and, and about your music and things, man. And uh, we appreciate that and. Uh, we will see you down the music road. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on, and we can't wait to get back to Texas. Our last show we played was in Houston with Pat Green. We can't wait to get back down there and see all the our friends that are Texans and see everybody. Yeah, come back to the warm country. Yeah, we will. I'll be back in about <laughs> October, and we'll stay the whole winter. <laughs> that's that's a good time. All right, Chauncey, man, we appreciate it, and uh, we will we will catch you on the next one. All right, well, thanks. Okay, long-winded. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, Arizona, it's it's hot, but it's not hot. Okay, I got to say this because I didn't understand it because I didn't know. It's 110 degrees in Arizona. It's 100 degrees in Texas. When it's 100 degrees in Texas, you walk outside immediately. The humidity, you're soaking wet. Arizona doesn't happen that way. You walk outside, you're hot. But you don't immediately start sweating, so it's weird. It was, it was a weird experience that for myself, but that's what's going on. So anyway, 
I got to get out here. I got stuff to do. Go to peppershirt.com, look around, buy a t-shirt, order some rodeo clothing t-shirts or shirts or on there. You can do those. You can buy t-shirts. You can buy whatever you want. Go do it. Look at it. Buy it. Something. I don't know. I got to go.